again and welcome to Foreplay Radio Sex Therapy. I'm your host, certified sex therapist Lori Watson, author of Wanting Sex Again, and blogger at Psychology Today and WebMD. And I have with me Dr. Adam Matthews, my co-host, who's a couples therapist, psychotherapist, and president of NCAMFT. Foreplay is dedicated to helping couples keep it hot. Each episode, we cover an aspect of sex that impacts your sex life and something that you can relate to. So if you find our discussions helpful, please give us a review on iTunes or Stitcher. We would love it if you would tell a friend about us. You can find us also on the web at foreplayrst.com. And if you have a comment or a topic that you'd like us to talk about, we'd love to hear from you. Please send them to us at info at foreplayrst.com. Thanks for listening. Now on to today's topic. So today's episode, Adam, we're going to pick up on part B for 10 mistakes couples make about sex. Right. So tell me how you're doing. (laughs) How many of these mistakes have you made, Adam? (laughs) That's what I really want to know. (laughs) I'm not telling you that. <laughs> Listen, you can trap me in this closet and talk about a lot of different things, and you can turn up the heat because I know that you do that on purpose because it's always hot in here. Yeah. But you can turn it up. But I'm not going to tell you all the mistakes that I made. I made about sex. Oh my gosh! Right. No, I have really not for my own sake. I would tell yeah. you, but I, I have probably made most of these. No, I mean, I think probably, it's definitely. True. I mean, definitely. It's they're so easy. They're such common traps. Yeah, I agree. I think that's why they're so universal is because I think the majority of us make most of these mistakes in our relationships, right? Yeah. And, and they're they're pretty common. But I, I think people think, you know, because we're talking about sex and we're really educating and and stuff that probably we don't make these mistakes. But you know what? Everybody does. Mm-hmm. Everybody has issues and problems. I think, if anything, that's what inspired me to become a sex therapist was yeah. – just you know, <laughs> all the all the stuff all the we've been through, <laughs> all <laughs> the mistakes, right. all my naivete, all the you yeah. know, issues that I had. Absolutely. Yeah, I think I think a lot of people assume because you know my wife is also a, uh, a couples therapist. Therapist, right? Yeah. So you right. don't have any marital and problems, right. then, right? And that's right. But uh, this is a part of the eye-opening experience. Was sitting, we were engaged, and we were sitting in our sex therapy classes uh-huh. to, uh, together, um, just kind of side-eyeing each other, you know, from <laughs> uh, across, across We across won't the room. have any of these problems. That's right. For That's sure. Right. We're like, oh, now we know. Uh, yeah. Not true. <laughs> not um, true. The last time in part A, the five that we looked at, just a quick recap, thinking good sex will come naturally, thinking bad sex is irreparable, a lack of knowledge, a lack of priority, and a lack of planning were the five that we talked about. So be sure to check out part A for those to first five. And these second five are just as good, but I think also maybe lack of thinking through it. I think maybe some people, the the first five, maybe that's occurred to them before. Mm-hmm. Um, but these five, I think, are really kind of, I think, in, really insightful. Like the first one we're going to talk about today, thinking desire is only hormonal right Right. this is something that i don't know that would occur to most people where they think that just desire just comes from um their body body. so if they have low desire then something must be physically physically wrong i mean they should consult with their their physician right sure but sure but i mean lots of women who have you know less than a tenth of hormones that men have have great solid desire and Mm. You know, men who have great testosterone sometimes have low desire. So, I mean, it isn't just that. You know, sex is this really human issue. Yeah. You know, how we feel about each other, you know, the love that we have for each other. We can turn off when we're angry. We can turn off when we're discouraged about the relationship. Hmm. And, And I think the other side of it is we can turn on. I mean, we can feel sexually turned on for issues that are not really about, you know, having desire, not not being horny. Mm. It's like some people who I talk to who, you know, maybe they want sex, um, usually men who want sex multiple times a day. Yeah. You know, I mean, oftentimes they are covering and masking a form of emptiness inside. And, and I'm not, I mean, I understand I, I'm not against good sex. I'm not not sex positive. I, I want people to have sex and I want them to have lots of sex. I I get that. But but one thing to analyze is not that they're just so much higher desire, but is this being used as something to avoid maybe an empty place inside? Especially the person 
who has had sex、mm. but doesn't feel that it satisfies or fills them, or、mm. they feel some sense of completeness afterwards. Like、mm. if they're just left always hungry, it's like a thyroid problem, right? I mean.、Yeah. Thyroid issues make you always hungry, but there's an underlying problem. And sometimes people use sex in in ways that are not so functional to fend off inner psychological problems. Yeah, I tend to think and believe that we are one. We're we're all we're one, and we try to compartmentalize all these different parts of、mm-hmm. us and try to say this is only physical, this is only emotional, this is only about. What I'm thinking, and、um, not realizing that all of those things are tied together, like and how much that our body responds to issues, that emotional issues, cognitive issues, all kinds of things、um, that are all interconnected, and it's really hard, I think, a lot of times to separate them out into just one or the other, and not say that my low sex drive or、um, my low desire. Is only physical when I've had this trauma that's happened, or I've had bad messages about sex my whole life, or our relationship is suffering. Yes, you know, and yes. like to I'm disconnected from my partner, or I've got somebody that's berating me all the time, or、right. whatever it is. And we like somehow our minds do this thing that is able to say that has nothing to do. One doesn't have anything to do with the other, which I think is is so false and so、um, keeps you from addressing the real issue. When you're when you're looking at it like that, yeah. I mean, I think this is what separates us out right from the animals is that for us, sex is not just biological drive. It's it's complicated,、mm-hmm. and we we need a complicated way of thinking about it.、Mm-hmm. Yeah, we need to. It's it's more complex. It's not it's not just it's not cut and dry for sure. Yeah. All right. So next cu- mistake that couples make about sex, attrition. What do we mean by attrition, Lori? Well, I think that as people marry and get partnered up, is that you know, okay, because of all the problems, the lack of priority, the lack of planning, that certainly frequency goes down. But more than that, there's also attrition in terms of what they put into it in creativity. So,、mm-hmm. so there's. There's errors, there's mistakes, there's misreadings. Maybe our partner has a funny look on their face when we suggest something. It's like, oh well, I'm never going to suggest that again,、mm-hmm. you know. Or, you know, you try something, your partner says no, and what they really mean is not today. But because we're so vulnerable when we suggest something sexually, what we hear is rejection,、mm. and so then we think, well, I'm I'm never going to suggest that again. And pretty soon we have this shrinking. Margin or, or, or this growing margin against what we won't try, what we won't ask for, what we won't do.、Mm-hmm. You know, so we, you know, sex becomes more narrow in terms of what's acceptable, and and often it becomes more boring. Yeah. You know, and it becomes less frequent because you know some couples come to see me, and I think you know the reason they're not having sex or they're not having good sex is because nobody would want to have sex that way. Yeah. You know, it's there's nothing thrilling about it. There's nothing exciting about it.、Yeah. You know, because it's just shrunk down to something so vanilla that you know、yeah. it's it becomes very habitual, very routine.、Mm-hmm. They have as humans, we are just oriented toward things that are repeatable, right?、Mm-hmm. And so we tend to fall into patterns or habits, automated responses that we can just do without thinking about them. And so, sex f- tends to fall into that category as well because we just do the same thing over and over and over again. We find, and I think that for some people, they do find a comfort a comfort zone with sex, and they stay in it. Yeah. Right.、Um, yeah. It's kind of like at a local restaurant, you find the menu item that you just like, the food that you just、mm-hmm. you know is good, and you're that, not. Well, you're that not, that is me, Adam. You're not willing. <laughs> you're not willing to venture out. I know it's a lot of people. I, I order the same、too. thing at the restaurant I go to. Right. right. But you know, you know. No, you know the the veal you know, cho- you know the veal、good. chop is going to be good, and so、right. you just you get it every single time, and you don't try something else for fear that it's going to be bad. And I think we do the same thing with sex, right? But you know the creativity. Sometimes I challenge young mothers, and I say, you know, that you just told me about this marvelous birthday party you planned for your child, and and all the creative things that you put into it, the the thoughtfulness, the planning, the the ideas, and you know, it's like put. Put a tenth of that into the bedroom. Yeah, you know, think of one new idea. You、yeah. know, think of one new place, one new position, one new trick. 
Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My husband likes to say, are you trying something new on me? <laughs> I'm <laughs> like, honey, you're the only man in America who would care about that. <laughs> 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 no, I mean, he likes it. He's just teasing me, honestly. But, you know. <laughs> uh, gotcha. Yeah. Okay. So we're saying mix it up, be creative, try new things. Um, right. Don't be, don't be scared of that. Especially, I think the rejection that you talked about is the big deal. So and, and stretch against that. the boundaries, yeah. you know, stretch against them and find a way. And I know there's people out there who stretch too far against the boundaries and, and they don't allow for enough process in it, mm-hmm. you know? So, so I'm not saying drive your partner crazy. Yeah. I'm saying, you know, to the partner who is shrinking, you know, yeah. that partner think about stretching against their own internal boundaries. I, I will say as a sex therapist, within my own moral bounds, my commitment is to be less inhibited than any of my clients, like within my moral bounds, you know, and, and it's a work. I mean, I'm a woman, you know, I suffer all the pressures of the beauty industry and, and everything. You know, it's hard to get uninhibited. It's mm-hmm. hard to become free and it's, but I, I actively think about pushing against the boundaries so that I can experience as much freedom as possible in this area. And, and I would say, you know, it's a lifelong work. Yeah. I think one of the things that you're talking about, Lori, that I think is really helpful, the way I conceptualize it is you have your comfort zone, but then right outside of that is the growth zone where you're yeah. growing and changing and evolving. Outside, well, I, right I outside like of that. I the way you put that, Adam. That's well, right, so powerful. Say well, that again. Well, right outside of that is the discomfort zone. That's when things uh-huh. get overwhelming and not get possible. But I think if you think of it as just three concentric rings like a target, yeah. the, middle, the middle is your comfort zone. That's where things are comfortable. That's where things are safe. Uh-huh. Um, that's where, but honestly, that's where things start to become vanilla, right, yeah. And, yeah. And, and routine. But right outside of that is just, like you're saying, just stretching one step outside of that one or two steps outside of that, that's the growth zone. Mm-hmm. That's where you begin to grow mm-hmm. and change. If it's too much or if you go too fast, then you're on the out, outer ring. That's discomfort. That's too much. That's going to start to shut you down right. um, and start to be harmful. But there is that space that's in between those, the comfort and discomfort, where there's you're oriented toward growth and things are continuing to evolve in a, in a positive manner. That just is, it keeps you moving. It keeps, it keeps a lot of vitality in life. I mean, that's what we want to do in general. I, I, mean, I like that because it doesn't create so much anxiety that sex then becomes an anxious act. Right. Yeah. Oh, I have things to say. We have to come back, right? Right. Let's okay. Take a break. So you're listening to Foreplay Radio Sex Therapy with sex therapist Lori Watson and couples therapist Dr. Adam Matthews. We'll be right back. Wanting Sex Again, How to Rediscover Desire and Heal a Sexless Marriage by Certified Sex Therapist Lori Watson. Each chapter is designed to fix one of the problems that cause low libido from early marriage through the childbearing years, even all the way through menopause. I've also had men read it and tell me that for them it was the most hopeful thing they read about resolving sexual problems. Look for Wanting Sex Again on Amazon.com. You can also talk to Lori Watson for therapy in person or via Skype. I offer couples counseling and sex therapy and I think about both aspects of the relationship, emotional intimacy and sexual technique and that combination together helps marriages be happy. Improve your sex and improve your relationship with Awakening Center for Couples and Intimacy. Find out more at awakenloveandsex.com. Awaken what's possible. It is one of my great joys in life to be able to really help individuals and couples find strength in their relationships and really find hope again. Licensed marriage and family therapist, Dr. Adam Matthews from Matthews Counseling. I work with a wide variety of issues, including depression and anxiety, marital issues, issues with adolescence. I believe that therapy should be designed around you, that it should be personalized to who you are and to your unique situation. Therapy is available in office, online, and by phone. I want therapy to 
to be comfortable for everyone. At our office, you'll find that we sit around a fireplace in deep, comfortable chairs, look at the problem differently, and offer practical solutions for you to take home and utilize outside of the therapy room. Schedule today and rediscover hope. You can find me on the web at matthewscounseling.net. Matthew's with one T. You can contact us through email or phone and find a lot of resources on our website, matthewscounseling.net. Okay, we're back talking about 10 mistakes couples make about sex, and this is part B, and we've talked just about attrition, and what's next for us, Adam? So our next mistake that we have that couples make is assessing um, their sex life based on one bad moment yeah, that they uh, have, and so many people do this, right? Sex is always, we're never supposed to make mistakes around sex, right? Sex is never supposed to be bad. And when it does, it throws us for a loop, right? Yeah, it does. We have one one moment where she doesn't orgasm or he doesn't get it up and all of a sudden everything's horrible. Or both. Or both happen yeah, at the I, same I, time. Well, I, guess I think twice, we've, one we've had that moment, actually. Uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I know my husband and I had one bad moment like on Saturday morning before we go for our coffee. And, you know, one of the things that I have to do is sort of talk myself down from that. You mm. know, it's like this is one moment and – you got to live to fight another day. You know, yeah. you, you got to live, you know, Sunday mornings are coming. Yeah. And it was just, you know, my husband had been physically active like for three days. I think he'd been fasting as well because he fasts like several days a month just for health purposes to clear out all those cancer cells and stuff like that. And, you know, I mean, he was just out of it and my mind was preoccupied and but we, you know, we wanted to be together and it was a disaster. Yeah. You know, it, and I just one of the things I tell myself when that happens is everybody has this moment. Mm-hmm. I mean, everybody has these moments and it's just you, you got to laugh about it. And I will say the one blessing of our sex life is even in bad moments, we manage to laugh about it. Yeah. I mean, we really do have a sense of humor in bad. And that is a saving grace. And my husband, God love him. He is so funny. And he, I think he's really just the funniest with me personally. I mean, he's a funny guy. and But the closer and safer he feels in relationship, the funnier he gets. And he always says, that's why you've kept me around. And it's probably true because he is so funny. And, and we use that, right? We yeah. use that to bridge these moments that are not so great. Yeah. I think that's awesome. I think that's really great because you, you, it's really hard not to define your whole relationship around, you know, a half hour or whatever it is. And I think as a sexual pursuer, this is the mistake, right, is we get very focused on the last moment Mm. and anxiety rises and and you have to contain yourself. I would say sexual distancers are more relaxed about it. It's like, oh, didn't go well, well, we'll try again. I mean, they they usually have more grace about that. It's, Mm. It's the sexual pursuing partner who says, you know, oh, no, their anxiety gets activated. We are... Sexual pursuers are anxiously attached. Mm. You know, our anxiety interferes with a lot of issues in terms of smooth relationship. Yeah. So part of what we're saying there is bad moments happen. Bad moments happen. doesn't have to define you. And especially if you don't let anger or disappointment or criticism of your partner get in there. I mean, then you basically you know, can have sex Sunday morning. Yeah. And I think our, our next tip actually ties in well with that um, or the next mistake that we're saying couples make. And that is they take things too personally. And right. they take. And so a lot of times those bad moments can be taken really personally as it's my fault or you don't want to have sex with me. You don't desire me anymore. Um, or there's, you know, it, it becomes very personal. And I mean, obviously sex is personal. But what goes wrong personally or changes personally, it it goes sideways. I I think about the woman whose husband has ED in one moment. And suddenly she believes that that means he doesn't find her attractive. Hmm. You know, and maybe it's a bad day. Maybe he drank too much that night, the night before. Maybe it's, you know, his own physiology. You know, Hmm. maybe it's his weight. I mean, it it could be all about him. Yeah. But when she personalizes it or thinks to herself, it's all about me, she's going to withdraw. And mm-hmm. I think the same thing for men, like if they think, well, I, I didn't get her to orgasm. 
you yeah. know, and so I'm not a great lover. Yeah. And it's like, you know, maybe it wasn't her moment. Maybe yeah. it wasn't, you know, she didn't put enough into it or she didn't tell you enough or she didn't want one. Mm. You know, occasionally women like to have sex and not have orgasms and that's nearly incomprehensible to men, but it is true. Yeah. You know, that that feeling of connection might be enough for her that one time. Yeah. I think we also take personally things like dips in frequency, things that happen naturally in the relationship where sex all of a sudden isn't like it was in the very beginning. And we start to take those things personally. And I, I think what happens when we take any of that that we've talked about internally is that we stop putting effort into sex, right? Mm-hmm. And I think it's... I we think withdraw it's a, to we protect would, ourselves. And it, it to, becomes... To protect our vulnerability. It really becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy at that point, right? Is that yeah. the things that we're doing aren't... We don't see the problem as external to us, so we're not doing the things that would might naturally solve it. Exactly. I gotta say, I've been really... Speaking of vulnerability, I've been really vulnerable on this podcast. <laughs> I prodded yeah, I'm, you I'm to in, be vulnerable, I, and then I, I just like I've opened been, and I've blabbed. Well, I shut, I shut it down. I wasn't... I <laughs> shut down that vulnerability piece really quick. Maybe I should be... Maybe I should be more, well, more vulnerable. I'll we're, find... We're gonna, we're gonna get you there. We're gonna get you there. <laughs> Slowly. <laughs> in the growth yeah. zone, you keep Adam. Me, yeah, in the growth right. zone. You keep me in this closet long <laughs> enough and turn up the heat enough, I'll just... I have, <laughs> haven't had food, so I'm just uh, yeah, eventually... But we, we keep keep Adam caffeinated. Like, <laughs> right, whenever we're right. recording, that's I like go to <laughs> Starbucks. I'm like, Adam, this is what a, do you need? Yeah, always, always. I need <laughs> he likes something. vanilla lattes. Oh, they need, okay. No, you don't tell skinny, people that. Skinny that's, lattes. That's too because vulnerable, Lori. He's a, he's you don't tell people guy. that. No, <laughs> and stop it. I like my coffee black, everyone. <laughs> she is lying. I like strong black coffee with nothing in it. <laughs> okay. From a mug. Sure, like sure. a man. Like a man. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, what's our last one? What's our last one? Let's move out of that. All right, uh, lack of talking. This is our favorite one. People, yeah. I think people are going to probably get tired of us saying this, but no one talks about sex. Like we can't, I mean, you can't just say it enough. I feel like you can't say it enough. Maybe we can say it enough, but a lack of talking is just always is and, a and this And this is feedback that we get. By the way, we are so grateful for your encouragement because Adam and I just do this right now for fun. <laughs> <laughs> but your encouragement does help us keep going. And oftentimes people tell us that they have begun talking mm-hmm. to each other after years of being married without talking about sex because of our podcast. And, and that's made and all the difference, right? It's made a big difference to us to feel like we're making a difference out there. Well, I mean, it's made a difference to the relationship. And it's made a difference I mean, to <laughs> Well, yeah, nice, yeah. It's, uh, mean, it's all about us, you know, actually. <laughs> <laughs> it's made, I mean, that's what people say. I mean, it makes a difference in your relationship because mm-hmm. you're actually talking about a lot of these things. And like we talked about just a few minutes ago, y- you begin to discover solutions to some of these issues that you've never thought about because you're actually having the conversation and getting out mm-hmm. of your head. And and I would say, you know, in terms of talking, I'm thinking of some people that I know and particularly, you know, try to listen, try to listen to what they're saying first you know, don't be so anxious. Mm -hmm. There's a course that sex runs and it's a long course when we're in committed monogamous relationships that, you know, there's, there's room to develop and grow and, you know, kind of trust the love of your partner that they, they want to get there too. And so listen carefully to what they're saying. Don't be anxious. And I would say, you know, do talk about your inner thoughts, what you like, talk about how you like it initiated, talk specifically, and talk in general, you know, Mm. about what sex means to you, Mm. you know, what what it does for you, you know, does it, how it grounds you, what your experiences were, share, Mm. I I think sharing the past, um, maybe, I don't think you have to do this, I don't think you have to share every last person you've ever slept with, and I certainly think you have to do that with tact, you know, Mm. but what you have learned from your past relationships, I think is might be something relevant to share. So, yeah. I like what you said about the the long view. I think that of the relationship. I, I think relationships are a marathon, not a sprint, mm-hmm. right? And so, when you're thinking about um, what you are building, right, you you want sex later on in your relationship to be better than what it is right now. So you're you're building something for the future. And so you're late by talking about it, you're really laying the groundwork. You're building a foundation for a good sex life, not just now, but for the future of your relationship. And so I think that that to me is why you talk about it. It's why you're, you know, you 
may not be able to be vulnerable with your podcast audience, but you're able to be vulnerable <laughs> with your spouse, right? That's where you're supposed to be yeah. the most yeah. vulnerable and right. talking about that. And it's scary. I think it's scary for people to have those conversations and to be able to talk about kind of their innermost desires and especially around something um, sex is a vulnerable in and of itself and then let alone to begin to talk about it is extremely vulnerable so we i think we recognize the difficulty that couples face in that but the value of it is so high that it's so well worth the risk absolutely it is it is well, you've been listening to 10 Mistakes That Couples Make About Sex. Can you sum it up for us what our last five were? Yeah, Adam? our last five that we talked about today, thinking desire is only hormonal. Don't do that. It's so much more. It's so it's much more complicated. Um, about attrition and how that's not just happens in frequency, but also happens creatively as well. So just taking some time to just step out of your comfort zone a little bit. Into the growth zone. Yeah. Assessing... Um, your relationship and your sex life based on one bad moment. So much more than that. There's so many more good moments there. So one bad moment doesn't define it. Or even one bad season. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Taking things too personally, internalizing that that it's all about you Mm -hmm. um, and that the things that you're going through sexually are all about you. Um, And then just a lack of talking. Right. Well, thank you. This is your sex therapist, Lori Watson, and your couples therapist, Dr. Adam Matthews, and Foreplay Radio Sex Therapy. Hey, help us stay on top here at Foreplay. We'd love it if you would subscribe and share it with your friends. And please take one sec and rate and review us. Thanks so much. 